This is Leo's Bag of Tricks, Learning Electronics, episode number five. It's all about diodes. So let's get right into it. Almost anyone vaguely familiar with electronics will have heard of the diode. It's the electronic version of a one-way check valve. It allows current to flow one direction through the device, but not the other. Now there are many types of specialized diodes. But for the purposes of this video, we're just going to dig deep into the simplest, most generic type of diode, the rectifier. And I hope that through this exploration, we'll start to illuminate the magic of semiconductors. In our post-vacuum tube world, almost every diode you encounter will be a semiconductor. The semiconductor is typically made out of silicon, doped with other elements, and physically configured to produce very specialized electrical characteristics. Diodes are two terminal devices. These two terminals are called the anode and the cathode. Typically the cathode is indicated with a band around the device or some other type of specific marking that indicates which terminal is which. It's extremely important that you can identify these terminals because unlike a resistor, it matters which way the electricity tries to flow through the device. Installing it in your circuit backwards will result in a non-functional circuit. The general rule of a rectifier diode is that when the anode is more positive than the cathode, current will flow. When the cathode is more positive than the anode, current does not flow. It's pretty much as simple as that. But within this simple idea lie some very interesting quirks and limitations. Let's look at these in detail. Let's create a simple circuit with a power supply, a resistor, and a diode. We'll forward bias the diode and measure the voltage drop across it. With around one milliamp flowing, we can see that we're getting a little more than half a volt. Why is that? This small voltage drop represents the non-ideal behavior of a real diode. It's like a tax that we pay to the diode gods for making the diode perform its nearly miraculous function. This voltage is referred to as the diode's forward voltage, or VF for short. This forward voltage is also temperature dependent, but it has a negative temperature coefficient unlike most other conductive materials we're used to, like metals. So when we heat the diode, we can see that this forward voltage actually decreases. This forward voltage drop represents a true energy loss. If we take the value of current flowing through the diode and multiply it by this voltage, we get a value in watts of the actual power that's being dissipated or turned into heat by the diode. By now we're used to the idea that a voltage drop appears across a resistance when a current flows through it, and it's linearly proportional to the current. But the strange thing is, if we take this diode and we increase the current by 10 times, the voltage drop across it does not go up by 10 times. It does increase, but you can see that it only goes up about 100 millivolts when we jack the current from 1 milliamp to 10 milliamps. So this diode does not obey Ohm's law. We call this strangeness non-ohmic behavior for obvious reasons. To gain a little more insight on this, let's perform an experiment. Let's measure this VF over a wide range of currents. We're going to start with one microamp and then run tests all the way up to one amp. That's a ratio of a million to one. 100 milliamps. Finally, one amp. So let's have a look at this data that we've collected. If we vary this current over a range of a million to one, from one millionth of an amp all the way up to an amp, the total voltage difference is only about 600 millivolts. We start out at 300 millivolts at a one microamp, and then blasting it with a full amp, we only get 0.91 volts. So you can see that every time we apply 10 times more current, the voltage drop only goes up by roughly 100 millivolts. 
If we graph this out on a linear scale, we get this weird hockey stick looking thing. But if we switch over to a logarithmic scale, it's almost a straight line. It's truly performing a logarithmic function. You can easily create an analog log converter by exploiting this property of transistors and diodes. This logarithmic behavior is both interesting and useful. In nature, there are things that follow this logarithmic pattern, like the growth of nautilus shells, fractals, and even sunflower seeds. This is why I like to think of this silly diode voltage as a window into the magical world of semiconductor crystal lattices and other such wonders. Okay, so I can already hear you all asking, what number for VF should I use while I'm designing my circuit? Well, it depends. It depends on a lot of things. It depends on the type of diode, the temperature, the current density, the manufacturing lot that you're dealing with. In point of fact, it's almost impossible to predict exactly what it is. But don't let that bother you. The good news is now at least you know not to expect it to be some magic value. Just study the data sheet very carefully. Look at the curves. And also understand that for most simple applications, it really doesn't matter that much. Another real-world quirk that we need to be very aware of is leakage. Under reverse bias, there's always a tiny bit of current that sneaks past the junction. This current can be extremely small, but it's always there. And it's also very temperature sensitive. It follows a logarithmic curve very much like the forward voltage. It will increase very rapidly as the temperature increases. In this test here, every millivolt of voltage reading on the meter represents 100 nanoamps of leakage. As we heat up the diode, you can see that very quickly the leakage goes way off the scale. So once again, study the data sheet carefully. Especially if your application is leakage sensitive, be very wary of the temperature dependency of this leakage. It's a killer. All diodes have maximum current ratings that must be obeyed. Take, for example, our garden variety 1N4001 rectifier diode. Its average current rating is listed as 1 amp, but it can take 45 amps for one millisecond if you give it time to cool down in between pulses. So this is where it gets interesting. Clearly the damage mechanism here is thermally related. This is why you can exceed the one amp rating for brief intervals as long as it has time to cool down in between. While speaking of current ratings, it's very tempting to think that you can just add diodes in parallel to get more current out of the situation. But in practice, this is a really bad idea. The problem is this. Remember how we talked about the temperature coefficient of the diode being negative? What that means is, when its temperature starts to increase, its VF decreases. If you have two diodes in parallel, the one with the slightly lower VF will hog more current. As it hogs more current, it heats up and its VF decreases even more. And this leads to a runaway vicious cycle. To explore this idea in detail, I set up this little test circuit. We have two diodes that are basically connected in parallel, sharing a two amp current. They're connected up by thin wires that serve an important purpose. Number one, they have a high thermal resistance, which means that they don't act as very good heat sinks for the diodes. Secondly, they have high electrical resistance, so we can use these two resistors as a bridge to detect the current imbalances in our circuit. There's a voltage drop that develops across each one of these little wires. When the voltage drops are equal, they cancel out to zero. When there's an imbalance, you'll get either a positive or negative voltage depending on which diode is hogging more of the current. When I apply a pair of pliers to the lead near the diode, it acts as a heat sink and it sucks some of the heat out of it, which immediately raises the VF of the diode. This causes the opposite diode to take more current. Doing the math on these voltage drops reveals that this current imbalance can be as much as three quarters of an amp just by changing how much heat sinking there is. So in general, Paralleling diodes for higher current is a bad idea. The same nasty problem actually occurs with LEDs. 
So don't run LEDs in parallel for this exact same reason. There are some exceptions to this rule, but let's save that for another video. Another really interesting quirk we should be aware of is the reverse recovery time of a diode. I made this little test circuit here that basically sends a bipolar square wave through a diode to my oscilloscope. What we should see is the diode blocking the negative portion of the waveform, only conducting on the positive half where it is forward biased. But what are these little jaggy spiky things here hanging off the negative edge? If we change the time scale dramatically here and zoom way in on these, we can see that for about four microseconds, the diode fails to shut off. It allows current to flow through backwards. This is called the reverse recovery. There are charges that are stuck in the diode junction that need to be swept out by the electric field. These charges take a finite amount of time to find their way out of the diode structure. The diode we're looking at here specifically is the 1N4001 rectifier. It's usually used for low frequency rectifier applications where this reverse recovery time is a vanishingly small part of the cycle and can be completely ignored. But were this a high frequency rectifier application, this four microsecond interval could represent a large portion of the operating cycle and create a huge loss of efficiency. For comparison purposes, let's take a look at the reverse recovery characteristics of a 1N4148 signal diode. These diodes are designed to switch low currents quickly. The data sheet states a reverse recovery time of four nanoseconds. That's a thousand times faster. Looking at the scope, you can see it's actually true. Not all diodes exhibit this weird reverse recovery problem. For example, Schottky diodes do not have this reverse recovery problem, but they often have very high reverse leakage currents. So it's always about figuring out what's important and optimizing around those things. Why do you think there's so many different kinds of diodes? Well, it's because it's impossible to make a perfect all-around diode that does everything super, super well. When optimizing for one parameter, you often screw up another. That's why manufacturers have to focus on making cost-effective products that fit well for specific applications. Finally, we have the most basic diode parameter that must be understood. That's the PIV, or peak inverse voltage that the diode can withstand. When the diode is reverse biased, there's a certain maximum voltage that it can withstand without breaking down. It's really easy to underestimate the peak inverse voltage that a diode may experience in a circuit, so use extreme caution. Always be sure the diode has plenty of voltage headroom. Use a diode with at least double the voltage rating over the voltage you expect it to see in the circuit. So diodes are obviously a really deep subject and we've just begun to scratch the surface in this video. There's tons of other diode types out there that perform functions that might seem totally unrelated to the humble rectifier diode that we just investigated. But the mother of all diodes is that humble rectifier. Over the years, researchers and manufacturers are constantly experimenting with different elements to dope the semiconductors, different physical configurations, different processes, and they're all trying to enhance little behaviors and little quirks that in one application might be totally unwanted, but if spun in the right way, become something totally useful. Like for example, back in the 70s, I'm sure there was a guy in a dark basement somewhere working on his diode late at night, and he looks over and he says, is that thing actually glowing? A few years later, we have the LED, and that's how this works. So if you like this video, click like, subscribe to my channel, and comment your heart out. Thanks for watching.